committee the whole meeting to order and ask for roll call. Bowman? Present. Burke? Here. Bonet? Here. Doyle? Here. Graf? Here. Manny? Here. Montemayor? Here. Moody? Excused. Perez? Excused. Rindfleisch? Here. Stefan? Here. Van Akron? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Wangelman? Here. Werner? Here. Weniger? Excused. Thirteen present. All right, we have a quorum. On that, I would ask for approval of the minutes from our October 20th, 2003 meeting. Are there any additions or subtractions? Hearing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes signify by saying aye. Aye. Sure, what's aye? Motion passes. Tonight, I would like to welcome everyone to our committee of the whole e uh, meeting. Uh, we will have an update and presentation on the Blue Harbor Resort project. And Paulette Enders will lead us off on this. She's our Director of Planning and Development. Paulette. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Warner and Committee of the Whole Members. Um, tonight we will have two presentations. The first will be a presentation by Joseph Haas, General Manager of Blue Harbor Resort and Convention Center. The second presentation by Inspectors Larry Hillblink and Pat Eyrick will describe the inspection duties of the city's building inspection department, um, those duties that they're performing during the construction of the resort and convention center. So with that, without further delay, I'll, in I'll turn over the mic to Joseph Haas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Paula, thank you for the introduction. My name is Joseph Haas. I have been appointed by the Great Lakes Organization as the opening general manager for this resort. And I would like to, just in a brief outline, bring you up to date of where we are and uh, the activities taking place. But before I do that, I would say, well, I would like to see if I can qualify myself of telling the committee, Mr. Chairman, uh, what qualifies me for opening a $60 million facility. I've, I was born and raised in Vienna, Austria, and spent all my life in the hospitality industry. I made my apprenticeship in one of the leading hotels in Vienna and ventured on to the hotel, made a three years hotel school, you know, over here we'd call it the college, over there they call it the school, and uh, which took me to France afterwards for a year and uh, one year to Sweden, and then later on, uh, had the good fortune of uh, falling in love with the island of Bermuda and I spent 10 years in Bermuda in the hospitality industry. I started as a busboy and I left as food and beverage director. And uh, in 1969, I met my current wife and we got married in 1970. We met in Bermuda. And uh, from Bermuda, we moved in 1974 to the United States and I started in Atlanta, Georgia and uh, spent two years with Holiday Inns. And then I had the good fortune of working for Leona Hemsley for a couple of years, and that was an experience in itself. And I opened a hotel for her, my first hotel in 1977 in Orlando, Florida. And from then in 1978, I moved to Honolulu, Hawaii, and joined the Sheraton organization at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And I was appointed general manager at the Sheraton Maui, and then later on moved back to Oahu to the Sheraton Makaha, and from Makaha to Princeville to the island of Kauai. Now, it's always the same organization, but, you know, Sheraton moves you around. And I had the privilege of opening the Sheraton Princeville on the island of Kauai, which was a $90 million facility. And from Kauai, I moved to the divisional office and became divisional vice president of food and beverage operation for 19 hotels, from Tokyo to Seoul to Okinawa to Guam to Saipan, Singapore and Manila. And uh, all the islands and the, all the properties on the island of Hawaii. And from then I was promoted in addition to my divisional job. I became general manager at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel for four and a half years. And I had the great opportunity to become president of Keystone Resort. And I ran Keystone in the state of Colorado, a little bit north of Denver, for three and a half years. And as so many things go, it becomes a real estate empire. It was owned by Ross and Perina at the time. Keystone was sold to Vail Associates, right? Well, that took care of me. I moved to San Francisco and joined an organization by ANA, standing for All Nippon Airways, a 900-room hotel right downtown adjacent to the convention center of the Moscone Center. I was there for five and a half years, it was my good fortune, the hotel was sold. 
And the company offered me to move to Ho Chi Minh City to Vietnam and open another hotel for them. And I just, my wife and I decided with four grandchildren this is no longer in our interest. So I came to and joined an organization very on a temporary basis in Fort Wayne, Indiana for six months, which became 12 months, which became four years. And I worked for the Kelly organization, Kelly Racing. I don't know if anybody knows the Kelly Racing team. But, um, and from then on, I had the privilege of moving to the Kalahari, a recruiter recruited me for the Kalahari. And um, as the good fortune happened, I identified a company which has probably treated me a little bit better than the Kalahari. So thank you very much for Great Lakes to pick me up. And that brings me to the great city of Sheboygan. And uh, I've been here now for two months. And I do have to tell you, uh, with the exception of the weather today, it's been absolutely delightful. I enjoyed the city. I had the privilege of joining Rotary, uh, not joining yet, but uh, been to a couple of Rotary meetings, and uh, Mr. Mayor was so kind to be with me one time at the Rotary meeting. But anyway, that, that's in a nutshell what I would like to say gives me some sort of a, uh, an authority that I, I would like to believe that I know what I'm doing, especially if, as a matter of fact, I just said this is the smallest hotel in my professional career I've ever been affiliated with. So I think that might, hopefully I would like to say that my, my experience will in, enhance the, the opportunity of making this resort and this uh, facility a product which absolutely stands head and shoulder above anything else which a boy can ever had, and that's obviously my goal. I pride myself with uh, attention to detail. I have a, I would like to believe, a great work ethic. 80 hours is an average for me, so. Anyway, I've been, as I said, I opened my pre-opening office down at the, on 712 on uh, River, River Drive right above uh, the uh, City Streets restaurant. If any one of you ladies and gentlemen would I come by, I'd love to have you give a little bit more in-depth tour. But as I just explained, it's becoming very difficult. As a matter of fact, I just said to Tom, I need to hire a secretary. It wasn't planned until probably the middle of February. The phone is ringing off the hook. We have more than two dozen weddings. When I say on the books, ladies and gentlemen, you can write it down, you can pencil it in until you have a deposit. You can nothing. So we like to believe the activity is very promising. And we are not even talking about the, camp, uh, the, the PGA. We're talking about basically small groups uh, from the... Salvation Army to weddings to groups from uh, from Milwaukee. We had a gentleman come through last week on Friday uh, because you heard about it. He made a, a specific stop here. Uh, he was going to Fond du Lac to stop just to see the facility. Uh, it has been. It's been. I think it has exceeded our expectation as far as the phone volume is concerned and the interest in the, the public at large, not necessarily the people from Sheboygan, because our phone calls come. 80% of our phone calls come from outside the city because the only inside city calls we get are the weddings and the small little groups. But any rooms activities usually comes from Milwaukee, Green Bay, uh, Minneapolis, and, and those areas. And I've, I've just explained, it's my goal that we have at least a third of the room nights on the books which we participate of the occupancy to be for the first year. We are very excited about the local support we have received. I only want to say thank you to not just to you, ladies and gentlemen, but to the, from the bank branch managers to the restaurateur in town. I've had numerous. As a matter of fact, just today I got two beautiful flower arrangements from local businesses wishing us a lot of luck and, and offering their support. It's, it's been... It's been overwhelming if I would say it's the least, okay? They, there was not one person who said, well, well and in any, any of any form or fashion, negative comment has not, ha I have not heard one yet. So I, I would like to take you through to the, to the process of it, but I think most of you ladies and gentlemen are aware of what the facility offers, the two restaurants, the convention for, con conference facility, uh, two nice uh, entertainment lounges, little bar, very comfortable, nothing flamboyant, but a very, a very alternate place for, for the local community, not just the hotel guests, to go and spend a beautiful afternoon overlooking the bay. Okay, I think that is one of the things. This resort is geared to serve the local community just as well as the outside guests because I have known and learned a long time ago, like especially on the island of Kauai, if you don't have the local community support, it's a tough haul. But if you work with the local community and you know that you're part of them and they're part of you, it's usually a hurdle which is very difficult, difficult to overcome or an easy go. 
So I will do anything possible and have so in my previous uh, positions in various different cities, I am a community uh, in integrated person. I, I've, I seek the help from the community and I hope this is the community seeks the help from us. Uh, we are here to be part of a team. We're here to be part to make everybody proud. Uh, the quality of the product, I think, speaks for itself. I mean, the money is, uh, and there was no detail spared to make it an outstanding facility. I will do my best that I can provide and hopefully exceed the physical product with the quality of service we provide. Um, I would like to believe that in the few years I've been in this industry, I've learned a few tricks and uh, and hopefully that I can make and put them to use here that makes you proud and when you come by and I will do my best that I, I will answer any questions you might have as it relates to further details, but I know there's a long evening ahead of you. I don't want to bore you with the rooms and the food and the beverage and, and so forth. Other than we're going to be very reasonably priced, we're going to be very competitively priced um, because we, you know, when somebody comes in and asks for a room, I said, I do, and they work for a non-profit organization, I said, well, I don't. <laughs> you know, so I, I need to make profit for my investors and for everybody concerned. So, ladies and gentlemen, this would, in a, in a nutshell, is who I am, what I do, and what I do best. And if there's any questions, I would like to respond to any one of the audience. Yes, sir. I be, I'm here Monday to Friday, 8 to, 8 to 5, 8 to 6. I to turn the lights off on me outside too early, so <laughs> there's no... No, I usually be in the office much longer than 6 o'clock, but it's, it's boring when there's nobody else around you, you know. But yes, I will be available any given day. I will leave some business cards here in Paulo. You know where I can be reached, uh, and so we'll see. Um, please feel free. I would like to welcome anyone to sit down and have a cup of coffee with me and answer any personal, professional in-depth questions if they might be needed. Thank you very much for your time, for your audience, and I, I appreciate it and wish everybody happy holidays to you and your families and be safe and looking for a great 2004. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Hey, Larry, building inspection. Uh, tonight, we would like to uh, present a brief overview of how building inspection is involved in the Blue Harbor project. Once the project gets out of the planning stage, um, the building inspection is involved from the moment dirt is moved until the final day before the uh, people move in. So we are involved in every facet of it, uh, building, plumbing, heating, electrical, and what we would like to do tonight is give you just a brief uh, summary of what we do, just a, a very brief summary because it's a very involved project. Um, this project is, is comprised of several different types of buildings. The conference center is a steel frame construction, and the uh, Blue Harbor portion of it, the resort, is wood frame. And the water park is a combination. The, the uh, water park portion is a wood frame construction, and the, the area uh, where the shower rooms and concession area, that's, that's uh, wood, steel frame also. We're going to start with the conference center tonight. And this is uh, early July when we just we're starting to move dirt the very beginning of the project. Uh, what we're looking at now is because this is a steel frame constructed building, the pads that we put down are for supporting of the entire structure. It's not a footing like you'd put in your house, it's just individual pads. And as building inspectors, we check that the bolt patterns are in the center of the, in the, center of the uh, pad, that the thickness is right, if the, the uh, reinforcement rod is correctly tied off, and um, just the location is, con is up to the contractor, but we are concerned with the strength of that pad. Next. Uh, if you could look here, we're looking at uh, the beginning of pouring the floor. Pat Eirich is here. He's the building inspector that is there daily, probably at least an hour a day we're on site. This portion, that they're just beginning on the south end of the, of the construction there. You can see that the, we check the thickness of the pad. We check if there's mesh in the pad, reinforcement rod. You can see that the the storm sewer pipe sticking up there, all the, the downspouts are already in place. They've already been inspected and checked and tested. Next. Uh, you can see that as there are numerous pads, each one is inspected before we um, are allowed, to, before the contractor is allowed to pour. We check the column size according to the state approved plan. And um, next, I have several pictures of this. If you take a look at the steel frame, 
uh, the electrical inspector makes sure that every portion of the building is grounded and bonded so that if anything would short out in an outlet in a wall or whatever, because the building is steel frame, he's required to make sure that every portion of the, the steel frame is grounded and bonded back to the electrical service so there is never a potential for someone getting a short on the building in any other portion. Next. This is another uh, part of it as we're just about ready to put the roof on. If you notice that in the very front of the picture we have uh, the fire hydrant installed. You see there's a fire hose off that fire hydrant. What is done, uh, the, each individual piece of pipe that's put in is 20 feet long and they're chlorinated with either powder or with some type of a pellet, a uh, chlorine pellet, and the, the main is filled. What happens at that point is we let it stand for 72 hours or more and then um, the main is flushed and it's checked for sanitation. Because this is hooked to our public water supply, uh, we have to make sure that it is uh, safe drinking water. So before any water can be taken out of that system, every piece of pipe is checked, every piece of pipe is tested. It's tested to 200 pounds of pressure. Everything underground in the building is checked to make sure that um, that is safe to drink. Next. Um, this is a, a picture of the bathrooms in the uh, conference center. This is only a portion. This happens to be the ladies' bathroom. What we check in in that uh, portion, these happen to be the water closet carriers that are in, in line. There's several more. There's probably four or five on the other side of the room, so we have more than enough during an intermission of a concert or intermission of a, a wedding or a, a, uh, anything like that. And what we check for on here is, uh, of course, the integrity of the plumbing portion of it, but also uh, the handicapped accessibility. We check for the, the stall heights or the stall widths and that they're big enough to get a wheelchair in. The state requires a given amount on each one. Also, we check for the height of the water closets. The handicapped water closets are much higher than, than the standard one, and we, are, uh, we check for that on before they have a chance to drywall. Next. This is a part of the men's bathroom. You can see that the, these happen to be the urinal uh, connections, but um, we do the same thing there. We check for handicapped accessibility. If you look on the, the left portion of the there's three vertical pipes right there, and then the left portion, there's a, there's a pressure gauge on that. Every portion and every piece of this building, uh, every piece of pipe in this building is checked with a minimum of five pounds of air pressure before they're allowed to drywall. Um, the contractor has to set up the test and I inspect it to make sure that um, it's all taken care of and that it, that it passes the test. Okay. This happens to be the, this is some of the interior shots that we have of the, uh, currently of the conference center. This is a steel frame interior. Um, these are non-load bearing walls because the, the conference center is a steel frame constructed building and all the bearing loads are on the columns. But we do have to inspect on these also the handicapped accessibility of the outlets. All the receptacles, all the switches have to be a, a given height so that uh, they're accessible to anyone that would be in a wheelchair or um, that would be handicapped in any way. So Mark is involved with every portion of that. Also, each, all those walls have to be bonded back to the steel frame of the building. So in case there's any type of a, a fault, that it would be uh, grounded out. So there's no potential for shock. Next. This is uh, another portion of it. That's standing in the main conference area. I took that just to, to show just how busy this place is. I've never seen, I've been in construction for 30 years, I've never seen a project go up this quickly or this, uh, this fast. It's just an amazing thing to watch every day. It just changes. And this happens to be the heating ducts that you see there. We check the heating ducts. They're, they have to be insulated. Um, anytime there's a penetration through a fire rated wall, there has to be a fire damper or fire curtain so that if there's a fire in one room, it stops and it, it stops at that point rather than transferring through the ductwork. So um, the reason I, I took that is just to show you how much activity there is on that site. Okay, Paulette? Um, this is the current entrance to the uh, conference center and it's, and it's uh, right as of last week Friday. Um, they're ready to put the roof on. What we check on that portion of it is we check the columns, the same thing that for the, the size of the column on, that holds up that roof. We check for the, the pads also, the bolt pattern, things like that. Next. This was early July and if, you can, if you've been down to the lakefront lately, you can see where we've gone in, uh, since July 1st or July 7th, I believe this picture was taken. That's the footings for the conference center. You can see they're totally different. They are, uh, entire the entire length of the wall pat checks for width he checks for the reinforcement rod in it um, and you can see that the entire wall stands on the footing rather than just the pads like the conference center so it's a totally different totally different structure and requires a little different uh, inspection okay that was the beginning of the hotel the resort portion of it um, this you can see is they're building um, 
the, the plumbing pipes that are in the floor, as I said before, each one of the plumbing pipes uh, have to be put in that floor. Each one of those you see is a, is a bathroom for one of the rooms on the first floor. They have, they have to be in the exact location. They have to have pitch and venting, and we check for all the plumbing codes. Uh, they all have to be tested. Same thing with five pounds of air pressure for 15 minutes before they can pour the floor. In the background, you can see they're building the stairway. Um, that's a rated stairway. Anytime you're in a, in a public building, once you're in the stairway, it's a rated uh, stairway so that if there's a fire in any portion of that building, once you're in that stairway, that's an exit access and you can get out and the fire cannot penetrate that. So that's why that's made out of block because the rest of the building is a four-story wood frame. Okay. There's the water heaters. Um, there's four 900 gallon water heaters in this project. Uh, each one is a million 200,000 BTUs. So it's, uh, uh, we, ha we shouldn't have any problem with hot water. If you had, had to have the, compare that to the ones in your house, you'd have about 134 water heaters just to put out the same amount of heat that those water heaters put out. And that's not even the water heaters that handle the laundry. That's extra over and above that. So uh, there's the water softeners that we have. We each, each room, all the water in the rooms, the bath, the showers, uh, even though the lake water that we have in the city is very soft, um, they are extra softened so that uh, it's, it's uh, better water, it soaps better, a little, a little more suds, so, okay. This is a picture of the lounge area on the north uh, end overlooking the lake. I just took a picture of that just to show uh, that each, the, the view that we have, Pat checks all the connections because it's a wood frame building. He checks all the connections, all the, the span of the joists, the thickness of the joists. He checks uh, the headers and all the, the construction on every portion of that building uh, is what he checks. And I just thought it's, it's kind of neat because it sticks out to the east and it's kind of a, wherever you sit in the lounge, you'll be able to see the lake. And the restaurant has just the opposite uh, flip side of that. It's exactly duplicate of that, but that would be the restaurant area. It'll be in there too. Okay. Um, this is standing in the atrium area where you'd normally check in, and if you look to the east, you'll be able to overlook the whole lake. You're actually on the second floor. Um, if you look up on the top, there's some temporary railings up there. Right now, uh, that's just made out of two by four, but what, we're, what we are concerned with at the final portion of it is that the railings are the right height, the spacing is right. Um, they, we make sure that the railings have, uh, the floor has a tow board, which is a little piece of steel that's about four inches off the floor, so that if anyone drops a a hairspray can or something, it doesn't fall four floors and roll off the end and hit somebody in the head. So we make sure that all the, the railings and handrails and guardrails are in position and the right, correct height. Okay. This is looking out the same, same uh, area, the second floor, where you would normally check in. You're looking down the ramp that they made and you're looking towards the west, towards the, uh, the river. It's a beautiful view out of either side of that building. No matter where you look, it's just a beautiful view. Okay. Uh, and here's the, what we're doing is we're standing on the fourth floor looking down into the atrium. You can see the hallways. It's going to be uh, the same thing with the railings. Is what, the reason I took that is you can see the temporary rails for the, for the contractors, but um, that portion right there is where we're looking will be the restaurant on the left side. There will be just in the bottom right where the ladder is. That would be the restaurant area, but in the front is where you're going to be checking in. Okay. Same thing here. We're looking out over the lake. It's just a beautiful view. If you look on this, is the outside structure just before we put in, before they started putting in the trusses, which is, this is several weeks old, this picture. Uh, you can see that the geofoam is there. I'll explain that a little later. And you can see the part that bumps out there. Um, this, is facing, this is facing the lake. Fisherman's Road is down to your left. And um, we look at the trusses when they get put up. We make sure that they're clipped according, they have to have something called hurricane clips on so that in a real uh, windstorm, they don't move or, or a tornado that they don't lift off. That's something that Pat is concerned with. This is the outdoor pool. Uh, you can just see the bracing before they put the concrete in. They, they, uh, if you look on the inside, there's a reinforcement rod that hold the wall up all the way around. Each portion of this, this uh, pool is again electrically bonded and grounded. You see the re reinforcement rod, there's lights underneath. If you've ever been in any pool, you see there's lights underneath the water. Everything is uh, bonded so that the lights, if they would short out, if there would be a, a bulb would break or something would happen, everything has to be grounded. And Mark makes sure he goes to every light, every piece of reinforcement rod. We check that out before they're allowed to pour the, pour the concrete. Actually, this concrete wasn't poured. It was actually blown on the wall with an air system. It's unique. They just kind of shot it on the wall and it's, it's kind of stayed there. It's really unique. I've never seen it done before. Okay. This is the other portion of the outdoor uh, pool. We would be checking also, if you can see on the left by the wheelbarrow there, there's an underground light. 
Uh, this is after it's poured, or actually it's on the inside, that's the bottom. We would be checking for the stair risers to make sure they're uniform. Um, and also, uh, eventually you're going to have some handrails on that stair that are made of metal. Mark would be checking to make sure that those handrails are bonded so that that also has no, no potential for uh, a shock, okay? This is geofoam. I don't know if you saw the article in the press. It's uh, actually pieces of styrofoam that are about four feet by four feet by about 12 feet long. And they uh, created a ramp to the front of the structure. And they're, they're about, at the building area, it's about 12 feet deep and it, it goes out a couple hundred feet from the building and it tapers down to nothing. And when you drive in from, uh, to check into the hotel, you're actually driving up to the second floor and that's where you'll be uh, going underneath the canopy and that's where you'll be dropping off the, uh, your, your passengers. The geofoam was put on um, to have equal compaction on the site. What, it, what we have now is they put the geofoam there and built a ramp out of it. You can see right in the center of the picture, there's a manhole, that's a storm manhole actually, and that much was covered with, with dirt. So they put the geofoam down, then they covered it with dirt, and that's going to be the ramp. Rather than putting 16 feet of compacted dirt, they put the foam down, and that's a, a much better system. I think. I believe I read it's the first time in Wisconsin that's being used, this geofoam. So I, there's are several pictures of it. I thought it was remarkable. I've never seen it before. Uh, they built it pretty much like you would build building blocks, your children would. They you know, laid a bunch of them one way and then they turned them and laid them the other way. And in order to make the curves that they needed, they had a hot knife that they just, or a hot wire. And they could just cut it with a hot wire. It was really unique. If you see in the center, a little bit to the left there, you can see a column. That's gonna be a column for the canopy on top of the building. Uh, but we'll, overhold, we'll hold the roof off as you drop off uh, the passengers. So it's a unique uh, structure, but the reason they did it is to, mean, to uh, keep the equal compaction of the site so that we didn't have 16 feet of dirt in one location. Okay? This is uh, one of the main things that building inspection is involved in. It doesn't look like much until we explain it. Uh, that's a plumbing pipe, and you see the red stuff, uh, that red caulking that's right there. I have several pictures of this. Because this is a wood frame constructed building, um, every uh, thing that we do, we are concerned about fire. It's a sprinkler building, it's smoke detectors, and it also has uh, uh, this, into, it's called intumescent caulking. If there would happen to be a fire on this, this individual chase, that's a chase for a plumbing pipe actually, that is required on every penetration, whether it's a piece of Romex, whether it's a gas pipe, whether it's a plumbing pipe, what happens if there's a fire on this first floor in this room, that intumescent caulking will swell to 10 times its size and completely choke off the hole so the, so the fire cannot crawl up the pipe in the chase. So you can go to the next one, Paulette. You can see here there's a piece of Romex going into the floor through the, through the two by four, and also right next to it, apparently someone had drilled a hole that they didn't need. There they all, what happens is if that Romex, if there's a fire below and that, that, and that Romex uh, jacket would burn off, uh, that caulking would completely swell up and cause it like a char and it would keep the fire from going in any, uh, any farther in any room. It's, it keeps it localized. Okay, one more. If you see on the bottom left, there's a gas pipe coming up. There's a few more uh, plumbing pipes. I think Pat was there today. We are, they're uh, anticipating starting to drywall on Wednesday, the, the fourth floor. That's the progress we have. But Pat checks every room, every penetration, uh, every piece of wire that goes through the floor to make sure that there's no transfer of um, fire and there's no possibility of transfer, especially we are concerned in a wood frame building. So what building inspection is always concerned mainly with life safety issues. And that's why uh, we are on site as much as we are, okay? Um, this I took being a plumbing inspector, I took this just to show you how each uh, individual pipe is tested. This happens to be in the basement of the water park. Um, they put a, a five pound air test on each individual pipe coming in and out underneath the site and between manhole to manhole. We've been testing it lately. And that's just to show that they plug the pipes, they fill them with air and they're tested for 15 minutes, okay? Uh, the electrical, Mark, this is underground wiring for the site. Uh, Mark checks the depth of the wires, the size of the, the conduit that's put in, the type of material that's put in, and um, he uh, uh, makes sure that it's all, you know, that it's separated, that we don't have too much heat produced. So he's, he's on site daily, and there's, a, there's a miles and miles of wire in this project. So he's there an awful lot, and just to make sure that everything is done, okay? I have several pictures. This is the main feed going into the water park. You can see there are several four-inch conduits there and many other ones for the lights and the uh, uh, 
the outside lights, the exterior. So it's, it's a monumental task to stay on top of this job, okay? You can see this is inside, this happens to be inside of the Blue Harbor uh, basement just before they poured some of the conduits. You can see that, you can go to the next one. Well, there's, there's just a few of the pipes. There's hundreds and hundreds of pipes sticking up. Those are all conduits. Each one is gonna have um, wire and they have to go someplace and it's inspected to make sure they go to the right place. We have to be careful of spacing. Uh, that the conduits aren't too close together so that if the wires get hot that they don't melt each other underground. We're concerned with uh, the number of 90s that are put in uh, between junction boxes. You can't have more than 360 degrees and all those minor details that we have to look at every day. Um, now this is the pouring. This is the water park basement floor just before it was poured. Uh, the basement floor was about two feet thick. They poured about 500 yards of concrete in one day. It was, a, it was something to see. They had it done, I think, by 11. They started early in the morning. Pat was on site to make sure that each one of those reinforcement rod, there's two layers of reinforcement rod underneath that floor, and they were uh, tied. Every other one has to be tied, twisted off, so that they stay in position when the concrete is poured. Uh, if you look in the back, you can start to see all those columns sticking up. That's the, those are the supports for the water slide portion of the park. And you can see that um, they're all... Many of them are poured concrete, and also every one of those columns has a, a number 10 or number 8 wire in it so that they are bonded so that there's no potential for shock from the water on top of the park or any, any metal object, okay? Here's another, another picture of the, uh, the park, the basement just before it was poured. You can see there's all plumbing pipes. This happens to be the water park building drain. This is the shower, showers in the, uh, in the water park, so your dressing rooms, each one has to be tested, has to make sure that it's vented properly, that there's pitch on it, that there's bedding under it before they can close it up and cover it and before they can pour the concrete on it, okay? Another picture of it, the plumber has it all, all ready to go. This is the basement of the water park. You can just take a look. I gave just, just took one little shot of the conduit on the ceiling. You can't imagine uh, the amount of power that it takes to run the pumps in that, in that water park. Uh, there are 26 different pumps in that water park and each one has to have a controller that keeps track of uh, they all go to different spots in the park, and also all the controllers that are involved with um, uh, the, the uh, filtering system. And there's just, the, 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 uh, it's amazing to see the amount of wiring that is just involved in the water park itself, okay? There's one of the pumps that, that are there. Like I said, there's uh, 26 pumps like that. They move about uh, 20,000 gallons of water a minute. The water park itself holds about 200,000 gallons just in the swimming pool portion of the park. It's about 200,000 gallons. So it has an awful lot of water that we have to get. Yes, go ahead, Paulette. Part one minute. Okay, we're almost done. Um, there's the columns. Um, same thing. We're showing some of the columns of the water park before we put it in. Go ahead. Um, some of the pipes that are underground, those are all the pipes that go to the slides. Okay. This is, the, this is how far we are right now. You can see that a lot of the features are up. You can go to the next one. You can see some of the stairways up there that are uh, in already before the, the building is done. We would check for railings. That's the lazy river right there that you can see the slides coming in. They go outside the building and come back in. We check for bonding um, and grounding on each one of those. And um, this is a picture of the beach, beach restoration. I think maybe Tom would like to talk to you about a minute or two about that. Tom Holton, our city engineer, because it's, they're restoring our beach back to its original, and I would entertain questions before he does that. Oh. One quick sure. We're just on our why, do we, why are we using uh, steel? Study the convention center one uh, in the hotel area. Why do we use steel all the way to What's the reason for that? Because of the clear spans in the convention center. The main rooms are so large okay. that it would be very, very difficult structurally to make those kind of stands to do it. With, with steel trusses, we're able to have larger, clearer other space. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you for your time tonight. And Tom, would you want to talk a little bit about the features? Yeah. You got one minute? Oh, you, you, we can give you a minute, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just stay longer. <laughs> Uh, we started the beach restoration about two and a half weeks ago. We opened up the bids that came in $200,000 under budget, which was a nice surprise. Uh, $1.3 million uh, were spent uh, about two weeks cleaning up concrete, rubble, brick uh, off the beach. We still have more to do. In some areas, we're out in the lake about 100 feet, uh, picking up still big chunks of concrete and building debris that were been dumped there over the years. 
Uh, they start placing rock today. We have a rock revetment that's going to protect the shoreline. Uh, we're hauling in fill. We're going to start creating berms with sand, plant beach grasses. We'll have a 12-foot wide recreational trail that'll parallel just along the uh, east side of Fisherman's Road with lighting, low-level lighting. Uh, next spring, we'll be in uh, to bury Fisherman's Road after the uh, most of the work's completed on the resort project. Our work is completed. Then all the access then will be through the interior of the site to get out to South Pier. We'll still have parking uh, for fishing and the recreation. Is that a minute? Thank you, Tom. Uh, does anyone have any questions at this time? Council? Uh, hearing none, uh, I guess I would like to thank everyone for attending this evening. A special thanks to Mr. Joseph Haas. We're glad to have you here. I think your credentials speak well for the future of Blue Harbor. Uh, Paul Etner, staff, building inspection, and everyone, and I wish everyone out there a uh, very happy holidays and a very happy new year. All in favor? Aye. We stand adjourned. The police property officer relative to disposition of found items by city employees. Seems Officer Lamb uh, brought this forward to the committee. In that time, I've been able to have a uh, discussion with the city attorney, and he's looked into the state regulations and, and provided us tonight with a handout. So I guess I would ask Steve, uh, unless the uh, council would like me to read this communication, I would be willing to do that. Otherwise, we'll let Steve give us his opinion. Reiterates the, the state statute there. Uh, Julie asked a question that dealt with uh, if, if a city employee finds uh, money or property while in the scope of their employment, uh, what happens to the item? Uh, do, does the employee get it if, if nobody comes and claims it, or does it go to the city? Uh, there is a specific statute that addresses this. It's 170.105 that was enacted in 1995. And uh, what I set forth there are the relevant provisions of the statute. It specifically says if, uh, you know, it deals with uh, other entities too, but as far as cities, if a city employee finds, uh, finds property of over $25 in value, uh, they are to turn it over to the uh, agency within the city that's been designated by the Common Council to receive lost items. Uh, and there's a process then for that agency to uh, put out some notice. And in the event the items aren't claimed, the property becomes the property of the city. Uh, as I indicate there at the bottom of the first page, I would recommend that the, uh, I guess we've never done this, um, under the statute, but I'd recommend that uh, the council bring in a resolution uh, at the next meeting or a subsequent meeting uh, to designate the police department as the agency within the city to accept uh, found money or goods for purposes of the statute. Uh, it's my understanding that we've had two recent situations where employees have found money and they did in fact turn it over to the police department so that's really the procedure that's being followed now anyway but we don't have any you know formal resolution in place like the statute talks about so I think it'd probably be a good idea to do that uh, other than that if you uh, have any questions I'd be happy to answer them yeah, thank you Steve does uh, council have any questions Alderman Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Steve, with respect to um, providing notice to the public as to what has been found, does that have to be done with each item, or can you city accumulate 30 items and then do one notice? I really should be done with each item, with you each know, unless item? you find 30 items at once. But, the, uh, you know, I, uh, an important part of lost and found is sort of timeliness, uh, getting notice out there that you found something. It doesn't do much good if you sit on it and don't issue the notice for three or six months. Uh, 
people will, you know, be long gone or. Okay. I guess I, would, I was just thinking of finding a ten dollar item and spending fifty dollars to give notice. Okay. Well, the statute only deals with items over twenty five dollars. Okay. But but it's less than that. It's not addressed in here. I guess we'd have to look internally what the policy would be there if a, if a city employee found a twenty dollar bill. Uh, in the restroom or something, uh, what we would do with it. It's not really addressed in the statute, and we can do whatever we want as a city on that. But, uh, okay. Thank you. Alderman Moody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, would this be like the uh, police auction for bicycles or abandoned vehicles where? Uh, that, that I would recommend to be in the, uh, in the resolution. Uh, in fact, I think I have it at the office. I, I drafted up a, a draft resolution while I was thinking about it. And uh, <coughs> what we currently have in the uh, police uh, policy manual, there's a procedure there for dealing with the uh, items that the police <coughs> acquire in the course of their uh, duties. If they find, you know, bicycles that are mm -hmm. uh, misplaced or whatever, uh, they they have a, a procedure where there's a, they're either uh, uh, provided if uh, the department can use the item or some other city department can use the item or they're uh, uh, applied at the public auction or they can be disposed of in some other way that's in the best interest of the city. And we'd have something like that in the resolution that would... Where does this apply to where people find things? I mean, is like if maybe someone loses a diamond ring at the armory, armory or something like that, or if that was found by a city employee, this mm -hmm. the statute would apply. There's, they would and turn the item over to the property people at the police department. Uh, a notice would be posted as required by the statute, and the statute just talks about 90-day notice. If it's uh, not okay. claimed within that time, then it can be disposed of. I think the police currently have been using one year for on, on uh, things like stolen bikes or. Uh, uh, you know, lost, lost property. Some of what they're dealing with also is evidence that's not claimed uh, as a result of, uh, you know, robberies and things like that. that okay. Uh, but it would uh, have to be something found in a public place, not something found, like, say, in a, a restaurant or... No, it, uh, anywhere. If a public, if a city employee, while in the scope of their duties, finds an item, uh, <coughs> this, this statute applies. They got to turn okay. it in to the designated agency, and uh, it's treated through that process. Okay, if it's over you. twenty-five dollars. Thank you. Great. Right, thanks for the clarification, Steve. So, for a city employee, if they find something on the weekend when they're not working, the regulations that would apply in that case would be the ones that apply to the general public. Is that correct? That, that's right. If you're not within would, the scope of the employment, uh, not on duty, uh, then a different principle applies, and that. That principle is more finders keepers sort of, you know, the, okay. the legal doctrine of finders keepers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> please apply that in school. I think. But I, I guess then, so your recommendation to the ethics board is to have, is to have a resolution drawn up to address this <laughs> this issue based on state statutes. That's and, what I'd recommend. And then bring it back. Does that have to come back to the ethics board, or can it come be sent I, to I the think it common council? Go on the council agenda and. You know, it'd be up to the council as to what you want to do with it, but I think mm -hmm. you could just uh, uh, have it lay over or refer to public protection and safety or okay. uh, whatever. Uh, that, okay. that leads into my next comment and the next handout. Um, as, as the chairman indicated, it has been a long time since the uh, city ethics board met, and uh, I remember back when uh, the ethics code was created. Uh, issue came up about administration of of the code by the by the whole council as a body, and it seemed a little cumbersome to have to call all the aldermen to address things like this. And so, back in '91, the council established the Judiciary and Legislative Committee as a subcommittee of the Ethics Board to initially review matters that came before the board. So, like this uh, communication from Julie Lamb could have gone to the Judiciary and Legislative Committee. Well, this handout shows that when JNL was uh, disbanded, uh, those duties were.
transferred by the council in 2000 to the uh, uh, Salary and Grievances Committee. So what you could do when a communication like this comes in is just refer it to Salary and Grievance, have them meet as a subcommittee of the Ethics Board, and then report out to it. You know, you wouldn't have to do that, but that's, that's a mechanism for dealing with some matters that may not be of, you know, that big an import that uh, you wouldn't need to meet as a whole mm -hmm. body. Well, that's, that's a good point for clarification on that, Steve. So on that, I, I guess what I would need a motion from the floor to approve the creation of our uh, RC from this committee that would uh, become a RO and get sent to the Common Council. Correct that? Actually, it's to draw the resolution. To draw the resolution, draft the resolution. The Correct. With that recommendation from the board. I have a motion. And a second from Alderman Roth. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. On that, the next item on our agenda is. All in favor, we stand adjourned.